this is the first session where we'll be looking at collectively managed uh, and collectively organized uh, communities, uh, folks around the world who are together managing their natural resources, their businesses, their homes, um, and so much more. For a lot of folks, uh, dreaming and talking about buying property somewhere with friends and family. This is a session for uh, getting a sense of what is possible uh, at small scales and also large scales. We're going to learn about a variety of kinds of collectives. Um, and for folks who are interested in back to the land, things like that, it's also great to have understanding of business cooperatives. Uh, most communities operate businesses um, and uh, these can stir the imagination of what us and our neighbors can do or grow into um, as well as to find more communities and businesses that um, are practicing the same principles um, so that we can find more customers and to build the networks. The traditional economic system um, is, and, and some folks are sometimes openly hostile um, to cooperative businesses and organizations. So it's important for us to <clears throat> work with each other to support each other. So, you know, just the most important thing for me that I see is that if we're imaginative enough together, we can find creative ways to meet our needs and thrive by applying the principles and patterns of these efforts to our unique situations, housing, food, medicine, health, energy, um, practicing governance together for local, for even our local governments uh, will be enhanced uh, by a bit more working together. Um, much of these aspects are for more formalized um, organizations which are themselves usually expressions of uh, more mature um, informal arrangements. The informal economy is uh, based, based on barter uh, and money. It's not so famous, um, but it's important to pay attention to because just as we think, um, you know, in the West and in the Northern, hemisphere that the industrial food system serves our, our needs. Well, I mean, doesn't really, but 70% of food consumed by people on this planet is from smallholders and peasant farmers. Um, similarly, 80% of the world's biodiversity is protected by less than 20% of landmass, which is controlled and stewarded by indigenous communities. So the benefit of us understanding these collaborative um, structures and techniques gives us the ability to um, work together with folks who are doing that work. I've got a study group on Facebook that some of you participate in. Um, uh, we've got some folks who are interested in a Slack group for long-term organizing and resource sharing. Um, and for folks who are interested in that, we'll email after this. Mostly the content of this is gonna be a survey of community enterprises, um, as small as buying clubs and as large as regional food shed projects um, that I've uh, had the good luck of 
uh, attending some meetings for over the last few years. Um, so we'll all get caught up together and see these. Um, let's see. Again, so many thanks to uh, Andrew, who's here for um, fingers crossed interpreting uh, for helping us make this possible. Uh, da, da, da. So it, and just a little bit more for the introduction, I wanna uh, bring up some, some of the reasons why I'm here. Um, and that is, um, well, first of all, it's been a tough year since COVID-19 and uh, the compounding crises, um, as well as the struggle for Black lives in the United States. So much of what we're gonna be learning comes from Black and Indigenous neighbors. Um, and so here's to the multiracial coalitions moving forward, working to achieve justice. So I'm dedicating this series to some mentors of mine, Kendra Gonzalez, uh, a tireless community advocate who ran a green and fair trade products buying club from her garage when I met her about 2013. She invited me to take her board secretary position at Ventura's Climate Care Options Organized Locally, which today operates the Ventura Bike Hub. And I'm just going to do a little screen. Now I'm going to go to screen share. VC Cool, uh, when I joined, was uh, uh, nonprofit and they operate the community bike shop, uh, the Bike Hub, also known as Bike Ventura now. Um, so Kendra was one of the co-founders of that and was also organizing to get schools uh, on Carbon Zero um, to get them with technologies for students. So this is for her. Um, uh, we lost Kendra this year after her almost decade long battle with cancer. So thanks for her. Um, and also Jim Mangus, a generous organic gardener who helped organize emergency food relief programs um, and food pantries around Ventura uh, until a surprise heart condition cut his life short in 2016. Um, and that was part of Food Forward that was distributing food um, to communities all over LA and Ventura County. Cheers to their work. And also my grandmother, Jeannie Barnett, a fierce nurse who raised six sons in New Jersey, um, who we lost just a few months ago to COVID. So this is dedicated to our ancestors who led together by example. I think we honor their memories by working hard and eating well together. We've got a lot of new ancestors this year, so may we be well guided. Um, this is also dedicated to the original inhabitants of wherever we are. For me, this is uh, the Chumash on the Central Coast. And uh, there's a few projects going on for us to be aware of uh, in support of Chumash communities today. Um, the first I want to share is the Chumash uh, Heritage uh, National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and Let's see, they've just had the petition going um, and are still in need of volunteers and people participating so that we can make sure that this happens to protect a huge portion of the California coast, um, which is bordered by the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and then the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So let, let's get one going for the another one going for the Central Coast. The next piece being the decommissioning of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. Now that's a good picture. So here on the website, we can see the power plant and all of the area that nothing has been happening in um, and the management of which will move from PG&E to 
uh, the community. And that those panels are going on now, um, getting ready for the official decommissioning to occur in 2025. And just a few pictures from my last uh, few years um, at Moon Phase Farmers. This is our website. Um, and these are some of the uh, growing and education projects that Angie and myself have been up to um, over the years. Pictures of us um, uh, with kids and with livestock and um, uh, let's see. And also, um, yeah, some of the food we've grown over the last few years. And Moon Phase Farmers is a um, workers cooperative that we started a few years ago, um, doing workshops and, and all the things. Um, and then a couple of pictures from uh, Community Gardens in Ventura. Uh, so some of the books I wanna uh, put on everyone's radar are, let's see. Uh, Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica gordon Emmert, um, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. Um, so this title is the most exhaustive look at cooperatives in the United States um, in, um, let me see, in over 100 years since W.E.B. Du Bois uh, published his studies on this back when it was a very new topic, um, but not new to African American communities uh, who've been practicing mutual aid together for a very long time. Um, and, and especially since the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, then I want to highlight uh, this title, um, Tending the Wild, um, Native American Knowledge and Management of California's Natural Resources. And in addition to some of the uh, hand skill techniques, uh, there's also a lot of notes in here about collaborative and collective management um, strategies uh, that folks have been using here on the west coast of Turtle Island for a long time. Um, highly recommend this book, um, pick it up and learn a couple things that are really within our context of California. Um, another title that's very fantastic, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin, Robin Wall Kimmer, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teachings of Plants. And uh, the author in this book describes a lot more practices uh, based on interviews and, and experience with folks all over North America. Um, so this one is really fantastic as well. And uh, they share some information about um, the ways that communities could steward uh, land together. And you know, some of us may already know that uh, Turtle Island, North America was a giant garden. And um, in this book, you can see more about what some of those techniques are, such as um, uh, a family band or a tribal group arriving in an area in time for a harvest and then celebrating that, then replanting for the next family or group who might occupy that area. Then I'd like to show you uh, the greenhorns. And on their website, greenhorns.org um, slash almanacs, um, these are books written by um, people who are um, getting back to the land. Uh, and their first one, do they have a picture of it? Uh, volume one. Uh, was in 2013, and every two years or so, they released another one. And volume three, uh, the commons here on, on this side of the screen, um, 
deals much more with how um, collaborative land use and management techniques from around the world. Um, but one of the big ones in here is the uh, acequias. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, which are irrigation ditches in New Mexico, but also around the world uh, that use irrigation ditches. Um, not so different from here in California with our um, state water projects, um, but here to see how um, those canals uh, have been managed um, for, it, you know, in here they talk about the last several hundred years, but much, much farther back than that for folks who've lived in these dry, uh, brittle climates. Um, and then the last book I'm going to put on, uh, well, no, not the last, um, but another book uh, to be sharing is uh, Practicing Law in the Sharing Economy by Janelle Orsi, um, helping people build cooperatives, social enterprise, and local sustainable economies. This is the book Janelle Orsi wrote before she founded the Sustainable Economies Law Center in East Oakland. Uh, and I'll tell you more about what they've been up to, but you can see on their website uh, so much of what they're working towards with the new economy. Um, and many uh, great uh, critiques of the sharing economy um, that big tech is so excited about and bringing it down for uh, the community scale. So um, highly recommend these books, um, ask your libraries to carry them, uh, uh, as well as uh, Regenerative Agriculture, uh, this book by Richard Perkins uh, in Sweden. Um, and this one, what I, what I wanna share about it is um, uh, the kinds of blueprints that they have for uh, financial literacy and understanding the different enterprises that could make up these uh, uh, farms that are producing a variety of uh, goods and food, you know, meats and vegetables and eggs and mushrooms and uh, fibers, um, tree crops, um, and also some of the uh, marketing cooperatives that are in action in Europe right now. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Then um, two podcasts I want to put on everyone's radar is the Upstream podcast, um, which has, it's just in its third year now, um, uh, that's doing great interviews uh, with folks and a lot of content about worker cooperatives, but also um, other stories about solidarity economics from around the world. Um, I tell a story often that I heard from this about um, what was happening in Greece in the late 2000s. After the global financial crisis, financial crisis um, due to speculative housing bubble bursting, um, Greek hotel workers would go to work in the morning and find that the doors had been padlocked. Um, out of country owners of resorts had shuttered them during the financial crisis. And uh, so local workers and anarchists cut the locks and reopened many of these hotels and other businesses. Um, later winning in court the right to operate these build businesses. Some of them were also being used for uh, as transitional um, facilities for families fleeing the war in Syria. So Syrian families were um, channeling through these resorts and hotels um, uh, donated supplies showing up every day 
and um, volunteers staffing the bars at night selling drinks in order to pay the utilities of these um, things that were going on. And pop-up um, uh, religious services and schools for children until the families could get resettled throughout Europe. So, uh, and that one is from their first season. Then uh, the Lift Economy podcast. So here on their website, um, and a few months ago, they had a great um, mini biography with um, Clark Arrington, um, uh, who says he was inspired by Marcus Garvey, uh, who was, was an organizer of the um, what was it? It was a shipping line between Africa and the US, um, the Black Star Line. Um, he started a couple banks. Um, and so Clark Arrington uh, is an attorney who's been doing work um, developing land trusts in the US um, and worker cooperative businesses and fair trade businesses. Uh, he wrote the organizing documents for, uh, what was that company called? Equal Exchange, and Equal Exchange is a fair trade company that uh, buys and sells uh, fair trade coffees and other goods from from all over, and um, you know, famously from communities working towards independence. Um, if you want Zapatista coffee, you can get it through Equal Exchange, and if you want, um, and back in the day. Uh, um, South African uh, goods as well. The first story I want to talk about is the San Diego County Food Vision project 2030. Um, in November last year, we got together um, for an event that uh, stakeholders had been organizing for well over a year, maybe a year and a half. And that was the carbon sink farming convergence. And here on the website, scrolling around, um, the, the, con, the convergence was the first um, indigenous-led um, convergence of this kind that, that I've had uh, the benefit of attending. Um, and it was meant to bring together um, over 180 delegates from um, people who are practicing traditional foodways, farmers and ranchers, um, scientists and technical advisors, policymakers and tribal leadership, students, funders, health practitioners, retailers. And um, to take it back to the beginning, um, a bunch of folks in San Diego got together to start channeling resources into um, their communities. And with the seed of all of those delegates, uh, they began planning and they got a United States Department of Agriculture Cooperative Development grant. And the grant was for this event and the report followed. Um, So we, we collaboratively populated notes from folks who came from all over the US uh, and abroad. Um, I met some cool Kenyan farmers here. Um, here we go. And so uh, the California Department of Food and Ag was also involved, the First Nations Development Institute, the Coastal Conservancy, um, Conservation Trust, Ceres Trust, and so on. 
and we met at Solidarity Farms, which was a project of this coalition of stakeholders um, at the Palma tribe, um, Luisiano uh, tribe, um, where we met for this event. And uh, putting together all those pieces is what eventually informed the San Diego County Food Vision Plan, a 10 year plan to re-democratize food and land access um, and also prepare for climate change. Um, then a couple months ago, um, we had the great benefit of this webinar, Whose Food, Our Food. And uh, if you go to the San Diego Food System Alliance.org website, find their webinar, um, you'll hear the story of how um, they began um, their first project after the convergence was for a marketing cooperative, which is the place to begin for food access um, and in the food system. And so they designed this plan and uh, finished designing it right up until March when COVID hit. And then they knew uh, what kind of uh, organization they would uh, be able to create. Um, we'll see how this screen share works. Might not be great. Um, I'll share, um, there's probably five different elements of the plan, um, which is a hub of food hubs. And so this first one that they began um, during the COVID crisis was um, like a community supported agriculture uh, CSA and they're providing um, a market for 17 farms eight of those farms being major stakeholders and four of those farms being co-owners of this business. Um, so it's a farmer owned cooperative. Um, they're sustaining this work through grants. Um, all of the staff positions are grant funded. And so everything that consumers are paying for their shares also supports solidarity shares that go out. Um, and they've, they've moved thousands of boxes and bags of produce. Um, was that six months ago, they'd moved thousands. So they've done quite a bit since then. The San Diego um, Food System Alliance project is inspiring. Um, and is showing what's possible uh, around the US. Um, and indeed, there are already many projects already uh, uh, doing work in those directions. I'm excited for what that will mean here in San Luis Obispo uh, for the, let's see, for our own uh, food system uh, organizing that's happening here. Next, I'm going to show y'all another nonprofit farm called the Abundant Table. Um, and this is an example of a faith-based community uh, supporting a farm business um, on its way towards becoming a farmer collective. Uh, this is in Camarillo, California. Um, and they are similarly operating a kind of food hub and CSA. They're buying from 20 something farmers um, and then selling shares. Um, and and their, um, their budget right now is made up, uh, they're running almost entirely on 
the commercial aspects of their organization. They still do some fundraising um, and they're still relying on philanthropy, but they're even closer towards being financially independent um, as they're forming into a cooperative. Um, so huge shout outs for the Abundant Table um, and what they've been doing in Ventura County. Uh, their annual report is gorgeous and so full of information. Um, so these models um, really spring from the, the history laid down um, through uh, mutual aid movement and uh, black farmers. And so here I wanna show uh, about Fannie Lou Hamer, who uh, I, we can read about um, quite a bit in Collective Courage. And also um, in, uh, oh, there, there's another book that's just about her. It's a biography about her. Um, and Fannie Lou Hamer, um, maybe on the West Coast, we. Uh, Arne is familiar with her. She's a lot more famous on the East Coast. In the 60s, she was one of the first uh, African-Americans in her community to register to vote. And so she traveled as a, an educator, uh, teaching folks how to pass the difficult literacy tests in the South. Um, and she did that with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, she was brutally beaten in one town for her work, um, but kept on doing it. Um, so in the early days of the student of the of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, she was a, a big force in that organization. Um, and later in 1969, she founded the Freedom Farm Cooperative. They started with a $10,000 donation uh, from a charity and they set up a, a community member uh, support system. Well, they were community supported and they did that um, with a, I believe it was about $1.25 per month um, and local families would be able to get access to this 40 acre uh, plot um, so that they could farm and grow vegetables for their families. And um, the farm also grew cash crops, um, peas and beans um, and other annual crops like that. The $10,000 in 1969 and $1.25 monthly uh, supporter fee uh, from their membership uh, today, it's, it's about one to seven the currency difference. So they began with, they first bought the land with $70,000, uh, those 40 acres. And then $1.25, it's about $8 a month is what families were paying. And, and there were thousands of families local to where they were at uh, who wanted to be members but couldn't afford that. So those are some economic um, considerations as to the kind of capital it took to begin these nonprofit um, ventures. One of the problems that they had with the Freedom Cooperative Farm was that they relied so much on um, charity, right? Philanthropy. Um, and when they, you know, going into the next recession, when that was harder to come by, then um, the the Freedom Farm Cooperative didn't last much more than four or five years. Uh, though one of the really cool projects that Fannie Lou Hamer did set up uh, was the year after uh, they started, um, when they bought more acres, they went from 40 to 640 acres um, and they started the pig bank and here, as I read off from the website, with funds from the National Council of Negro Women, the co-op bought 35 gilts, female pigs, and five boars. 
And over the next three years, they produced thousands of pigs. They taught families how to take care of pigs and then would send them away with a breeding pair um, or a breeding set. And then they had to return the next year uh, the same number of pigs to the bank. And that was the pig bank. Um, the, the thing about pigs and rural living is that um, a family and even an extended family might barely scrape by on uh, subsistence farming um, and selling some crops at market, uh, some commodities. Um, but uh, to have a single pig um, would provide all the fats and all the oils that even a big family could need in a year. Um, and even back in Europe, uh, uh, b before capitalism, um, and it was, what was it, the, uh, before landlords became more like um, what they are today in modern capitalism, um, peasants then, if they had raised a pig, um, could be, could take it easy. So pigs are potent in terms of food sovereignty for communities. Um, then uh, on this website, check it out. This is the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, digital website, snccdigital.org. Um, so much to learn from this website. These folks have been around for decades now. Um, listen to Fannie Lou Hamer in her own words. Uh, listen to her sing. She had a great singing voice. Um, and read some other things like, uh, they've got some old newspapers here to read about rent strikes in Visalia, California, um, 1965. Um, so much uh, for us who, um, don't have access to a lot of our elders. Um, we lost so many in the last few generations between the AIDS uh, epidemic and um, just the ways that we um, don't get to enjoy our intergenerational households or, or challenges with shared languages. Um, shout out here to all these pictures of folks um, from Ventura County signs here from Oxnard and um, El Rio. We've been working on all this stuff together for a long time. Um, so again, let's study up, um, inhabit those multiracial coalitions that uh, make real just happen in the government and uh, in local municipal areas. Um, just a few other things from uh, the book, Collective Courage, that I'll share with y'all. So I want to talk about mutual insurance cooperatives. Where are we? So mutual aid groups um, operating out of mostly churches um, uh, had been um, doing collections and supporting uh, the families of widows and um, helping with the expenses of burying family members and, and sometimes with purchasing the freedom of folks who'd been enslaved. Um, so that they could join maybe their families who had uh, already found their freedom, um, fought or escaped for it. Um, and later, after the Civil War, when uh, African American families uh, were practicing uh, uh, sharecropping, um, would also um, 
get insurance, um, uh, buy insurance from uh, mostly white owned businesses. And when they were being discriminated against for things like payouts and you know whether they were getting less than uh, their white neighbors or not getting anything at all, even though they had paid in, um, black communities began to operate their own um, mutual insurance groups um, and cooperatives. And uh, over time, those mutual insurance companies um, ran into problems with the ways that they um, benefited from being able to deny coverage for lapsed um, payments. Um, and so it's not a very, very long-term sustainable model, um, but the wealth that communities were able to build based on those mutual insurance groups led to communities being able to start um, uh, to, to, uh, continue to formalize and form um, enough capital to form credit unions. Um, there are some jokes that uh, Jessica Gordon Emmer describes in the book that, um, you know, sometimes they couldn't help but open credit unions because they had so many resources sitting around before they would have to make any kind of pay payouts. And then based on the success of those credit unions were able to support the growth of businesses uh, and communities like, um, like Black Wall Street in Tulsa um, and many of the other communities that were in the, the North even uh, before they were uh, bombed or folks chased out and just terrorized. Um, so these models worked then and um, with with some changes, there's there's so much for us to learn about um, uh, carrying into the future. And um, Dr. Nimmer in her book, um, great resource, she shares the meeting minutes from some of these organizations. She shares the organizing documents. She shares letters um, between directors and um, and other thought leaders over the last few hundred years who were participating in building these things. Um, so Penn State University Press website, Collective Courage, check that one out. Um, hear the interview with her. Then um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Essequias um, from the New Farmers Almanac. Um, and uh, wish I'd gotten some scans. Maybe I can get some, get some permission to do those. Uh, these were um, the way uh, these are managed in New Mexico is every year everyone who uses this irrigation ditch gathers to uh, clean the ditches. And every three or five years, um, a new major domo is elected. Um, and the major domo, uh, like a president or chief executive, uh, is in charge of making sure that all the members are um, paying their share of the maintenance costs and also participating in um, the ditch cleanings, uh, clearing of brush and things like that. And also um, that they're not overdrawing their water allotments. Um, and uh, that person is elected every few years. Um, the, it's a centuries, millennia old institution here in North America. Um, so plenty for us to, to learn and, and the Essequias in New Mexico are still in use. Um, these people are still managing um, uh, amongst farmers and ranchers, um, their shared water. Um, plenty of lessons and uh, 
principles for us to study in their uh, organizing and in their management, um, their financials for us to similarly design land and resource management collectives. Um, then, let's see, we'll do a new one over here. Let's see. Uh, when I want to talk to you all about uh, Wangari Matai. And let's see. Ba, ba, ba. Wangari um, is a Kenyan uh, social and environmental activist. Um, was the first African woman to win the Nobel Prize. Um, she studied in the US and then uh, went back to Kenya where she organized um, mostly women who were uh, campaigning for more political rights. And then later, um, you know, after so many of those political successes, she founded the Green Belt Movement, which is a multinational continent long uh, group of uh, NGOs um, and community groups um, replanting trees um, and working on environmental uh, conservation, uh, women's rights, because um, with uh, desertification um, happening across the equator um, and heading southward um, through Africa, um, smallholder families are getting pinched between um, terrible weather and uh, locusts this year. Um, uh, torrential rains in years before um, are uh, planting trees for the uh, benefit of stabilizing the climate stabilizing water cycles and creating more um, crops for folks to use um, for commercial support uh, and as well as um, for the health of their families. Wood is the still the most used energy source in the world for uh, home heating and cooking. And uh, a lot of environmentalists um, have a lot of scientific literature about renewable energies. Um, I think wood is a will be a surprise uh, contender for um, potentially carbon negative um, resource management. We'll see. Um, and so, uh, Wangari Matai is a um, huge person for us to uh, pay attention to and as well as all the organizations um, that she worked with and which um, spun from her legacy um, that we can continue to learn from uh, how they're organizing um, and getting things done in Africa. So that, that's great big scale and I wanna talk about one more great big scale. Um, which is the, the Lust Plateau Watershed Rehabilitation Project. And um, maybe this is the right website for it. Let's see, unpause. There we go. Um, this began almost a decade ago. Um, in China, the Yellow River, the um, I, I'm forgetting the name of, of the river, um, but it's yellow because of the sediment that washes out of um, this valley um, called the Lust Plateau. And the Lust Plateau is the Chinese cradle of civilization. Um, 
where um, for so long communities began there in China and that area has been degraded um, and desertified. And over the course of a few years, the Chinese government came and reorganized and gave, uh, they passed laws banning certain um, management techniques for grazing livestock, um, as well as um, tree cutting for fuels and um, certain crops grown for market. At this point, the, the Lust Plateau was um, nearly barren except for the communities who live there and people, you know, young people and families fleeing for the cities um, and no trees able to grow because of what grazing animals were around, eating everything down, any tree getting cut for wood. And so um, families were paid, people were paid to do the work of um, building terraces and also planting trees um, and having some of the land re-divvied up. And families were also granted long-term tenure agreements so that as long as they took care of the land according to what the Chinese government had deemed was most appropriate, they would have uh, continued access to it. Um, and if you look up uh, the work of a documentary filmmaker, John Dennis Liu, um, he's got some really striking um, video of what what's happened to this place that has become verdant you know it's looking more like paradise than the desert that it was and this was a huge project 640,000 square kilometers um, that's close to a million and a half square acres it's a huge area it's what, what is it the size of France um, was where they worked on this project. And that's an example of a state run um, collective effort towards uh, revitalizing an area's ecology and economies. Let's see. So, um, Now I'll, I'll talk about some, some more things that are just a bit more generalized. Um, and these being, uh, you know, at our scale, uh, meeting our own needs if we're not uh, actively participating in a cooperative or a collective, um, an easy version of one are buying clubs. It's finding some folks that live near you who need the same essentials that you do and buying in bulk and storing that and distributing it among folks who are paying in. Um, that's one of the, uh, the smallest versions of a co-op and, and it's traditionally what so many folks, um, so many study groups as Dr. Nemert found uh, would begin with um, on their way towards opening stores that didn't discriminate against African Americans, for example. Um, and some popular uh, buying clubs today uh, would be Thrive Market. That one's online only. Um, and for a membership fee, you get access to their lower prices. And that began as a health food products buying club for people who went to Burning Man together. Now it's a, a company that even has uh, solidarity memberships for low income and veterans. Um, and they, they've got all the grocery things now that you could buy online. So um, that, that's one example and that's consumer buying clubs. Um, 
consumers also happen to start uh, cooperatives like uh, food cooperatives. We've got quite a few of those here in California. Um, as I look, I can see that most of the people here in the webinar are California folks. Most of you I know. Um, so the Ventura Food Cooperative, the San Luis Obispo Food Cooperative, the and in Santa Barbara, the I forget the name of it, a food cooperative by the um, university. Those are consumer owned cooperatives. Uh, the consumer members um, pay for access and to support the business to uh, cater to them the products they prefer. Um, that is a kind of cooperative. There are multi stakeholder cooperatives, um, which will be made up as well of the consumers and also the workers and also um, maybe community investors. And that's a powerful model uh, that I'll have some more information about, some more diagrams of on uh, the Moonface Farmers website soon so that you can see those. And those are um, some ways that we can do fundraising in our communities thanks to new California cooperative regulations. Um, that have uh, that are on the books as of the last few years. Um, many thanks to the Sustainable Economies Law Center for their work there. And oh, yes, uh, I'd like uh, one more. I'll get to later. Um, another example of cooperatives would be the. Um, if folks are familiar with the, the brand in the supermarket called Organic Valley, um, they sell milks, um, dairy products. So that one is a Wisconsin founded cooperative. Um, I think over 50% of their members are Amish and Mennonite farmers. Um, and together they pool their uh, dairy products to sell in the bigger markets, um, in the grocery stores and so on. And um, so they sell their milks during the milking season, they sell their cheeses. Um, and diversified into vegetables so that they could keep their um, grocery buyers um, purchasing from them all year. And so through their diversification of products from their farmer members, we're able to um, keep those commercial relationships um, throughout the year. And then um, as the co-op grows, and it's called the C-R-O-P-P. Um, I had a window of it open, but I'll uh, open another. Uh, here we go, 1988, seven Wisconsin farmers um, started this one. And they have quite a few different brands that they uh, do. And, and also uh, uh, farmers advocating for organic, which does grants uh, for organic farmers and grants for organic farmers to pay marketing costs. Um, 2,000 farmers in that cooperative now. Um, then, um, so that is a farmer-owned cooperative. That's a producer-owned cooperative um, compared to the consumer-owned or the worker-owned. Um, and there's potential for multi-stakeholder cooperatives that are made up of a variety of stakeholders. You know, it could be all of those together. And there's um, plenty of potential for those all over the US. Uh, I think I'm just gonna talk about three more 
things. Now I'm going to talk about housing, um, housing cooperatives and land trusts. Uh, housing is the big thing, right? Um, nobody likes paying rent. Um, so I'll, I'll begin by going back to the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, where um, together attorneys and real estate professionals have been designing their um, the permanent real estate uh, cooperative. Let's see, I'm going to pull it up. Bu, bu, bu. East Bay. So the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative currently owns uh, two or three buildings of apartments. They um, purchase and have long-term um, uh, leases that are at below market rates to local folks. Um, they have a fantastic a bunch of media that they produce about um, the nuts and bolts of their organizing and documents. Um, check them out uh, online, check them out on uh, YouTube and Instagram. Um, they are purchasing, they're taking properties off of the speculative commodity market I just read in the news, um, there are three vacant homes and apartments for every homeless person in the Bay Area. Um, so the East Bay Permanent, Permanent Real Estate Cooperative is buying those and making them available uh, in community. Um, some of you may have been following the Moms for Housing um, in the Bay Area. Um, a couple homeless mothers uh, and their children took over a house in Oakland and the Permanent Real Estate Cooperative was part of those folks um, that put together uh, the financing for them to purchase that home. And it is now um, permanently affordable housing. Um, after all that shook out. Um, the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative um, operates um, using land trusts. And a land trust that I'm excited to share with y'all is over here, not this one, um, but Agrarian Trust. An agrarian trust operates um, a few land trusts around the US. Um, and there's a new one in California in the Cape Valley, um, north of Sacramento. The one just before that, the Little Jubba, Central Maine Agrarian Commons, uh, Minnesota, Montana. Um, and the format for uh, what agrarian trust is doing as they're setting up these agrarian commons is um, here we go. The agrarian trust national organization um, doing fundraising uh, works with a community um, to, which is everyone from consumers to farm to table restaurants, you can see on the right, local land trusts, the US Department of Agriculture, um, and um, Slow Money um, Cooperative Development Institute, together with the community, uh, 
they create a commons board. And in this case, um, the one I want to talk about in Maine, the Little Joba Central Maine Agrarian Commons, um, the Somali Bantu community had been living in Maine for a decade or so, I believe. And um, that was after um, being refugees uh, in Somalia, in East Africa, having been di displaced um, for a variety of reasons. And um, not able to build any kind of generational wealth. Uh, and so their community organization, working and organizing um, with other residents of Maine, um, Agrarian Trust, uh, some of those others that I mentioned in Land for Good, uh, American Farmland Trust, um, put together the package to purchase what they call liberation farms, which is a property held in trust. It's a different kind of uh, corporate structure, a 501c2, um, which has a 99 year lease um, to the commons board and to the Somali Bantu community. And so they're farming it um, cooperatively. Uh, they're farming uh, some cash crops and also uh, kitchen vegetables. Um, folks are farming for uh, their own, you know, something that they're gonna sell and um, really great videos and media on the agrariantrust.org website uh, showing how they've set this up during COVID. Um, and so this is a land security and equity example um, that is uh, growing around the US. Um, and I think a clear um, example for us to follow with so many other refugee communities who are coming to the United States. Um, rather than being criminalized or hidden away or anything like that, we we can set folks up with the land that they deserve to uh, make a living and um, feed themselves uh, culturally appropriate foods. Um, and here, this has a little bit more on the Agrarian Trust website about Little Jubba. Um, here we go. Um, it's not quite the um, the blueprint, well, it's kind of like a blueprint of, or the, the way that they, um, you know, their checklist that they did. Um, but the retiring farm owners um, sold the farm to Agrarian Trust, um, uh, who, let's see, well, it's, it's not exactly clear to me, and we can look further into it um, in other sessions and um, on Facebook uh, or Slack or whatever communities um, that we're continuing these conversations in. Um, but they, they, get, they get the cash and they um, make that land long-term. They get land long-term tenure uh, for these families. Um, then I want to talk about one more um, called uh, Sylvan Aqua. Let's see. Okay, and Sylvan Aqua Farms um, for a couple of years has have been a startup farm um, and they're growing uh, mostly meats um, and um, so lots of chicken, uh, pork um, and they're building a, um, a great big uh, project and this is happening all right now in the last few weeks. Um, is some big changes that they've been up to. Um, 
So their goal, and I'll read this off of their website at sylvanaqua.com, is uh, their goal is to democratize food and agriculture in the DC region, meaning a mosaic of public and private lands serving as a base to produce wholesome food from healthy ecologies, and a vertically integrated employee-owned cooperative of farms, nurseries, mills, processors, retail outlets, and wholesale distributors, um, offering food available at greatly reduced prices without sacrificing ecological values and agricultural opportunities open to more than just the most privileged members of society. Um, so their focus based on the success of a single farm uh, operating on leased land um, using models popularized in the regenerative agriculture movement, um, but made to serve black and indigenous uh, and people of color um, communities um, with so many learnings from uh, previous examples. And um, Chris Newman, uh, one of the founders uh, on Sylvan Aqua Instagram, um, uh, has great uh, media here talking about uh, why they're moving in the way they are and what they've learned from the example of even Fannie Lou Hamer's Freedom Farm Cooperative. Um, and the reliance of some of these operations on um, fundraising and philanthropy uh, being not secure for long-term uh, food sovereignty. So some of the rest of the vision for what Silvanaqua is up to are um, the uh, intensively managed sections of farmland that are doing regenerative ag, um, paying attention to soil health and, and also community health, and also large scale indigenous land management um, and producing commercial and gift um, products for um, folks in their um, huge vertically integrated, integrated um, how he described it as a, fed, a confederacy of cooperatives um, that are uh, going to manage land, you know, owned land and also do farming as a service um, that landowners could pay for. Um, so they're going to be making great big moves this year. They just finished fundraising a, a few hundred thousand dollars that they're using to invest in creating this um, network of cooperatives. Um, let's see, 15 minutes left. Uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about um, Gosh, what I haven't touched on yet. There's uh, still so much. Um, uh, you know, these are some formalized commercial uh, le and legal structures for operating collectives. There's also um, uh, other ways of organizing. Um, the Zapatistas just celebrated their 27th anniversary of their founding of uh, autonomous um, communities, um, which are municipal councils and, um, and caracoles, uh, other smaller forms of uh, organizing. Um, and they're up to, oh, they just announced a few, maybe a few days ago, um, they've grown to 12 caracoles and 31 municipal councils. Um, and these are uh, indigenous Mayan folks in Mexico. Um, and so the ways that they're practicing cooperative economics and, and governance 
right? Um, you know, so many of these things are uh, about economic power and sovereignty, which, um, you know, in the practicing of uh, gives us the, the skills and techniques for um, more collaborative uh, governance, you know, which uh, cities are corporations, towns are corporations, um, states are corporations. They're just different kinds that uh, have the power to write laws that govern other commercial corporations or land controlling corporations. Uh, much, much of the language is uh, the same. Um, so uh, folks, if you've got feedback, we're gonna end the session in about 12 minutes. Uh, I'd love to hear um, comments or questions, um, uh, maybe directions that you'd like to see these go in the future. Um, I'm so excited to share uh, some of this with y'all um, outside the scope of just conversations or emails and to produce more of this media um, for all of us to have better literacy around these topics. The Oh, there's so many more directions to go, such as with um, platform cooperatives. Um, and, and that one is particularly pressing um, as uh, the COVID crisis has um, been the scenario for tech companies to um, amass so much wealth that um, comes right from our communities. When a profit motivated company um, is operating for the benefit of their shareholders only, then um, suppressed wages and high prices are the method that they can do that with. All of that value leaves communities. Platform cooperatives are an example of how the technology that these companies use for sharing economy um, companies, how they run their businesses, right? Whether that's drivers, um, whether that's meal delivery, whether that's um, uh, tasks and gigs, um, all of those can be recreated at a regional or local scale. Uh, there's a big story a few weeks ago that New York City uh, cab drivers union was starting their own Uber service. And so the, the technology of the apps and the websites um, and the, um, the commercial participation are, are just the platforms that any community, um, any multi-stakeholder cooperative could adopt to create a service where um, rather than sending the profits to shareholders only, um, those profits could be shared with um, workers. Um, they can be also, you know, if there's less of a motivation for profit, then there can be lower prices, there can be better pay for workers, and some profit um, for folks who are investing in those. They won't be these um, wildly profitable things that um, attract so many, so many dollars to tech, um, but they're enough for folks to, um, that many, many folks want to uh, pool their investments in. Um, one thing I'll, I suppose I'll show, uh, slow money, um, is a national and international organization. And these are folks who, um, are interested in supporting regional economies, um, and food businesses. Um, these are for folks who, um, make investments who don't want to 
put their money only in those things that are profit motivated, they recognize that there are um, slower ways to make money with returns, you know, rather than getting up into the 10% and the 20% of return on investment, um, 8% uh, or 5%. Um, and, and to start an organization that um, is meant to be operated with a reasonable return to shareholders, um, like the example of equal exchange is totally possible. And to remind y'all, Equal Exchange was a worker cooperative that buys and sells fair trade products from around the world. And when they started that company, Clark Arrington, who I showed that um, Lift Economy uh, podcast about, it's a great series, it's four episodes. Um, this guy's done cooperative organizing work in the US and in um, founded universities in Dar es Salaam um, and did so much, um, you know, was a national cooperative developer in Africa before he came back to the States and is now working at Agrarian Trust, setting up things like the Little Java Agrarian Commons. Um, he describes in some of these interviews how uh, the bylaws of a business, which are, which is like the operating system of a business. Um, if you're familiar with coding or programming, um, you know, a lot of these legal documents are, it's just programming for uh, how the money moves in that organization. And in this case for equal exchange, um, investors uh, were told that, you know, your money, you know, we could fail, the business could fail but we're gonna to try to get you a 5% return on your investment every year, um, which they were able to do every year and, and sometimes more than 5%. Um, so if you're wrapping your mind around the financials and the economics of some of these things, um, we might not all have the financial literacy for how to get these kinds of things going, um, but together, we can share notes. Um, and again, as Dr. Nemart wrote in Collective Courage, groups that began, um, that studied cooperative economics together, um, that was one of the first predictors of success of a cooperative enterprise. And even if that um, cooperative business um, for you know, a variety of reasons, maybe it was a uh, lack of um, financial and business management skills, um, sometimes hostility within the local marketplace uh, that drove them out of business. But any group that started a cooperative together for meeting their um, needs through the effort and the organizing and the skilling up um, and the sharing were able to better their economic situations, um, whether that business went on and lasted decades or whether it lasted three or five or seven years. So there's, uh, I think, so much hope for us to um, take advantage of where our ancestors have done this work, for us to read their notes, read their letters, read their organizing documents, um, and to join together with um, a variety of communities so that we can um, bring so many of the unutilized resources, whether they're locked up in speculation or, or for whatever reason, so that folks um, can start meeting their own needs. Um, and so, uh, not to belabor this, uh, to try to fill up the time for another couple minutes, but thanks everybody for uh, showing up and uh, listening to me um, go on about all these things um, that I've got such an interest in and so glad to share with you. Um, and so many thanks to Andrew um, 
for bringing um, ASL interpreting for an hour and a half. Um, and please folks tell your friends um, about more of these sessions that we'll do um, so that uh, we can all learn more together. Um, let's see, just checking chat, let's see. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's not easy to just talk to uh, the screen for so long. Um, so what I'll do, everybody who signed up for this, um, I'll send out an email uh, that's got um, not quite a transcript, but it'll have a lot of the things I was talking about, um, things that you can follow up on, uh, as well as a few of my own ideas uh, that you might share with uh, folks that you live with, um, your family, your friends, uh, coworkers, um, to start thinking about um, cooperative organizing uh, wherever you're at, as well as um, um, so that we can show up for folks who are doing this work. You know, don't go start your own cooperative without any study and, you know, ragtag group or whatever. Um, find some folks who've been working at this for a while and have some experience. Um, uh, support their efforts. And then based on the successes of folks who have been doing this, we can, um, you know, just continue to build. Um, so I'll close it out here. Thanks so much. And uh, I'll probably do another one of these in a few weeks. Thank you. <laughs> All right, cheers everyone. Hi, Heather, I just let you in. Um, we're done now. Um, I'll send, I'll post a recording online.